Sentinel that has protectors, those guys are coming back in. He's pretty much just coming back in. Just coming in. I'm assuming we can move the election officers to the end, right? Uh, Mark wants to do it first thing. Okay. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. He told me that today. <laughs> Engaged, tell us something different. It's got to be something to do with the projector. You know how people protect their back of the normal projector? Both of them. Hi. Hi, Rick. How's it going? Good. Hope it didn't embarrass you. Oh, it's awful. Good. Good. Glad to hear it. Sure, it's pretty. Sure. Sure.
And uh, we, we have election. Oh, I'm sorry. Stand for pledge of allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, it's time for election of officers. So. Uh, we will approve the minutes of December 13th. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve as presented. Second. Discussion? See none. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. And now, reduction of officers. So uh, it's time for the vice, vice chair and chair to be elected. And anybody that uh, is a uh, voting member can actually be uh, nominate themselves or be nominated. So do we have any suggestions or requests? I'd like to nominate Mr. Loisel for chair. If I could speak to that nomination. Uh, as discussed last meeting, uh, it's not my preference to be chair, so I would like to uh, just reconsider. Because of my work, the amount of time I have to dedicate to that, uh, I can't be here a lot of times, and I will have international travel, which I can't control. So uh, my preference would be not to be chair. So. Just please consider that. Okay. Thank you. Oh. I, I do appreciate the nomination. But I'd you. like to um, offer my nomination up. Are you interested in being up, Chair? I would nominate you. But. No, I'd nominate you. I'm not, I'm not going to be oh, Chair this year. Yeah. No, I'm not going anywhere. Okay, so I have a nomination. So I have a second. Wait, you nominated Lee, right? Yeah. Second. Discussion on that? All in favor? That's unanimous. Except for abstention from the right. And now, Vice Chair, uh, do we have a motion for Vice Chair? James, would you have interest? I do have interest. All right, <laughs> nominate James. Peter. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. I will Thank you. cede my seat to. Uh, I think you should do this meeting, Mr. Chair. Pardon? This should be your meeting. Oh, that's, uh, what's that? Uh, Mr. <laughs> Chair, does he have to sit next to me? I guess I'll leave the flip on that one, Mark. Spot. Proceed on appeal number 2624, a limited reduction of yard size by Thomas and Michelle Melander, 6 Pearl Street, Assessors Map, U2, parcel 81. Who do we have presenting for the I don't think anybody's going to. You want to? No. Yeah. It's just a, a I thought we were going to uh, deal with one? those first two items yes. together. Okay. This one and this one, yeah. Okay, so we're doing 2625, a limited reduction of yard size by Dominic Fortier. 8 Morning Street, Assessors Map U2, Parcel 125, and Appeal 2621, Administrative Appeal Request by Joseph and Candace. No, we're not doing that. We're not doing that right now. these two. Okay. I apologize. Thanks. So that's based on the current point, so we're just correcting it. So okay. So we're re-adopting what was approved. Okay. Awesome. Now, do we need to go any further than that? We do just, not. Okay. Does anybody have any questions, or are we just re-adopting as they originally put it? I agree with that. I do as well. Anybody else? Move approve. Did you say move to approve? Yeah. Second. All in favor? We need to open up public meetings. It's unanimous. I need to get signatures though. Okay.
Okay, so appeal number 2621, administrative appeal request by Joseph Candace Sutlak, 82 East Grand Avenue for building permit 2017-0955 for East Grand Avenue, assessor's map U22, parcel 112. Have yeah, everybody presenting? Please take the podium. Please state your name and I will. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Jones. I'm the attorney in Jones Warren here in Scarborough. And I represent the Helen and Joseph McCann in the South Act. And they live at uh, two weeks right now. And this is regarding an appeal, administrative appeal of a decision by the court enforcement officer regarding property in the state of Butt at 4 East Grand Avenue. And uh, as you know from your materials, that's an R4A zone. And we're appealing the decision by the court enforcement officer which basically granted a building permit for a two-story accessory unit structure, a new structure, uh, within 16 feet of the front lot line. And basically the code enforcement decision, code enforcement officer's decision was, was that this, this building, because it was a grandfathered non-conforming lot, did not have to be set back 30 feet as required in this in this uh, zone. And our four zone is basically a 30 foot front lot line setback and 15 feet rear and side setback. So basically, if you look at our argument, and uh, I submitted uh, a letter with our argument as well as pictures and an affidavit from my client, and I hope and I want those to be made part of the record, please. But basically, the code was the zoning ordinance states that all new structures must conform with the ordinance. And we're not, and this, this is a non-conforming lot, which already has a building, a principal structure on it. So this is the applicants who are trying to build a new two-story structure, which we claim is within the building envelope. And, um, and the building permit should not have been issued. And the code enforcement officer's argument is under section 2D1B. Uh, that states that no lot other than one that's been created after 2003 um, shall be built upon unless there is access to the lot. And we don't disagree that this is a grandfathered lot. Um, and therefore, and it's a non-conforming lot, therefore it could be built upon. What we're saying is, so we don't disagree with that interpretation, but, but he's expanded that way past that to, uh, to that to, set, to state basically not only um, is there is there uh, is this grandfathered, but any new building doesn't have to have a front yard setback of 30 feet. And so he allowed an issue to build a permit, even though this new structure only had a front line setback of 16 feet uh, in its closest place. This this lot is behind my client's house. There's a 10 foot right of way that leads up to this house, um, the applicant's house. And that's basically the front lot line. That's where the right of way and the access to this lot hits the lot. And, um, and, and that's, that's where the people drive in. This is also a, a, a 10 foot right of way that's shared with my client. So they both use the same exact 10 foot right of way to access their property off East, End, East Grand Avenue. So, we don't disagree that a building could be built on a non-conforming lot, but the zoning ordinance still applies that all buildings need to conform with the zoning ordinance, which is it has to have a front setback, side setbacks, and a rear setback. And, but because the code enforcement officer issued a building permit showing only a 16-foot setback for this new two-story structure, we think that was an error. The main Supreme Court as, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no section in the ordinance that says that actually deals with what we're talking about tonight. So you have to interpret this um, as a town attorney has, has indicated to you in a memo. Is that you have to interpret this, your, the ordinance will not to create an absurd or illogical or inconsistent result. The whole purpose of zoning is to eliminate non-conforming uses and to reduce non-conformity. And in this case, what's happened is if you have a non-conforming lot which actually has a, bit, 
under the code enforcement's decision as a larger building envelope than a, co than a conforming lot, which is, which, which is right next door. And that goes against the whole purpose of zoning. So by the code enforcement's decision, he's created, because it's not required this lot to have any front lot setback, he's created a bigger building envelope for a severely non-conforming lot. It's non-conforming in size, it's non-conforming in access, it's non-conforming, it doesn't have street frontage. This is a non-conforming lot, which already has a building and a house on it. And he's allowing another structure on the property only 16 feet from the front lot line. And we think that's an error. That, that, for that to happen, it needs to come before the, this board to do that. There's also an inconsistent result because of the code enforcement officer's interpretation. Is under this zone, the side and the rear setbacks are the same. They're all 15 feet. So his decision basically is, well, it doesn't matter if I find it to be a side setback or rear setback, they're all 15 feet. But in order to determine a rear setback, you have to know what the front lot line is. You can't determine a side setback until you actually determine the front lot line. And, and the code enforcement decision is this, this, this lot is non-conforming, doesn't have a front lot line. It doesn't exist on this lot, which we think is an error, that every lot has to be determined to have a front lot line because you can't determine the side setbacks or the rear setbacks unless you do that. And, and if you, in a Higgins Beach zone, where you have a rear setback of 30 feet and a front of 18 and a side of only eight feet, well, that, that would be critical. Because you, in order to determine a rear setback, you have, to, you have to determine where the front lot line is. And the same with the side. But in this, so this, this, <coughs> This is inconsistent, this decision, because this lot in Higgins Beach would have a different result than it is in Pine Point. And, it's, and the only difference is it's in a different zone. It, the same lot would have, a, would have a different result. And if you look at the definition of, in the ordinance of, of, yard, of, of yard side, and you look at the definitions, and these have been provided to you by the town's attorney, of yard front. And, and these definitions, it, it, to determine what a yard side is, it states that a yard side is the lot line extending from the front yard to the rear yard. So for the code enforcement officer to determine the side setback, he has to determine that there's a front lot, where the front lot line is, and therefore that's the, wherever that is, that's where the 30 foot setback would begin, and where it's the rear. And you can't determine the side logically unless you can determine what the front is. So we believe, just, just from a logical interpretation of, this, of the ordinance, that the code enforcement's decision is misplaced and it's mistaken and an error. The second argument in the alternative would be if you look at the definition of street, we fit under that definition, according to my client's affidavit, of street. And in the last paragraph of the definition of street, it talks about for the purposes of determining required setbacks under the ordinance. The term street shall mean any of the above, plus include any right of way, which is what we have here today, which is described in the deed or plan. We provided the deed. These are deeded right of ways to the applicant's property. And my client has the same deeded right of way for this 10 foot right of way that leads up to his property, uh, which provides a principal means of access to abutting properties. We have that here. Under my client's affidavit, which we've submitted, he uses, and the pictures you can see from the pictures, they both use the same access. It's the same right of way. I mean, it's basically the width of a driveway. Uh, it's only 10 feet wide because it's a grand property. But they both use this property. They both use this right of way. So that is providing. That is, in essence, is providing access according to the definition of street, which means where that where that right of way stops at the applicant's property is the front lot line, because it's it, it at, it's on the street, and that should be and from that front lot line, which is the entire width of that front lot line, 
there should be a 30 foot setback from that line. So that's our argument. I, 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 I'd like to have um, an opportunity, of course, after the code of, law, code of enforcement officer testifies to cross examine. And I want to make sure that in your package you received our application and that you also have the staff memo and the, uh, and the letter from the town attorney regarding this issue as well. So that I want to make sure all the materials are in the file that we have. Everybody has the packet, correct? And everybody have a chance to re review the letters that were sent out? Mm -hmm. Yes. And my client is here. I provided by affidavit in order to shorten the time for these hearings. But my client is here to testify. If you have any questions regarding the facts, uh, this case is a little different than the other ones, where it's more of a legal issue, an interpretation of the statute, rather than a, 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 a actual issue that, that needs to, where we need to really uh, find out what was going on in the 1930s and 40s. So this kind of appeal is really not relevant tonight. But I'd be more than happy to answer any questions or have my client testify. Okay, thank you for your thank information. You. Would you like to elaborate on? Um, so, yeah, so uh, for those who I haven't met yet, I'm Jay Chase, I'm the uh, planning director in town, and where this application is an appeal <coughs> of the finding of the action of the zoning administrator on a building permit, He's actually one of the folks who will be testifying before you. Um, so I'm really here to serve to help with process. Um, and so just to lay out, and that, as I think was pretty well articulated already, that through the appeals process, um, there's opportunity for the appellant, who we just heard from, to present their case. And then there's uh, opportunity for the zoning administrator to present his case on the matter. Um, after those two items are done, there will be opportunity for public comment, um, and then discussion will pursue through the chair, in which there can be sort of, um, at your discretion, either questions to the board or um, sort of a, a, a back and forth of testimony, again, at the board's uh, discretion. And ultimately, what the board is being asked to determine tonight is uh, really you have three courses of action to take after your deliberation. Uh, one, to affirm the, the action of the zoning administrator. The other would be to reverse the action of the administrator. Or the third option is to modify the action of the administrator. We can sort of talk through those, um, you know, again. Uh, but in terms of the uh, merits of the case, I'll um, turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, to... Um, the zoning administrator is in a better position to speak to that. And so with that. Okay. Mr. Longstaff. Yes. Brian Longstaff, the zoning administrator for the town of Scarborough. Um, as I said, uh, and, and I think as uh, Attorney Jones has already stated, the definitions are really important because this is a non-conforming lot. And we have many non-conforming lots. And that's what makes this lot unique. The first definition I want to point to is that it's in Section 2D of the ordinance. It says, no lot other than a lot of record lawfully created prior to November 5, 2003 shall be built upon unless there is access to the lot. Access is defined as uh, uh, street frontage on a public way, connection to a public way over one or more private ways, accepted by the planning board, uh, so on and so forth. So this lot does not, because it's a lot of record, as opposed to some newly created non-conformity, it's allowed, as you said, to be built on, and it does not have to have frontage or access. You could theoretically build on a lot with no access, meaning our definition, if it was a lot of record. So that's the first point I want to make. Also, um, Attorney Jones points to our uh, definition of street, and I agree with everything he said except for one thing. It says that uh, for the purpose of determining required setbacks under the ordinance, including setbacks for corner lots, the term street shall mean any of the above and shall also include any right of way which is described in a deed or plan recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds and which provides the principal means of access to abutting properties. He's interpreting that to mean that the sat laps are the abutting property, which they are. But there's also an abutting property beyond the, uh, the four East Grand property. And that 
right of way does not provide access to that property. Therefore, it stops right at the, the line of 40 grand. It does not continue on beyond. I interpret that definition to mean that you could have a 10 foot wide driveway type road, something that's old, been there for years and years, that continues on by and therefore creates frontage for all of the lots that use that road. That lot does not create frontage for for East Grand. It only provides a way to get to for East Grand. So my determination was that there was no frontage because there's no street meeting the definition and it does not abut the adjoining properties beyond it. Um, if you can envision an old road with many non-conforming lots on it, that road could theoretically be the street and therefore you could apply that setback. I argue you can't apply a reasonable setback to a line which serves the satellite property as a sideline. It cannot be the front line for, for the Forey Screen property, the property beyond. Therefore, there was no frontage. No frontage, no front yard. No front yard, we revert to side and rear setbacks, which happen to be the same thing, and, and typically are throughout the ordinance. Why he's bringing up Higgins Beach, I have no idea, but if there were a landlocked property at Higgins Beach, we would probably find ourselves in the same situation because it's a non-conforming lot. There would have to be some determination made as to whether or not there was street road. I can think of no lots at Higgins Beach that meet that requirement, save one, and, and I would argue the same thing. It has no street frontage. I would come to that same conclusion based on the ordinance and the definitions of the ordinance. That's how we got to where we are. As far as the structure itself, it's meeting all of the setbacks which it did not meet, or the original structure did not meet. You can see on the plan there's uh, the structure to the upper left of the lot is the one that's there now and will be torn down. And then the one that's got the darker outline on it is the new structure. And actually, that, there's a better plan, Jay, that says C1, uh, C101, I think, has the actual. I think you had it up. Yeah, yeah that's the one. That's the one. Do you want me to zoom in a little bit? You can blow that up a little bit. That would be great. Let's see what I can do. <laughs> Maybe I'll come in a little closer. I don't know if anybody can see this. I just sort of try to highlight some of the things were, that were pretty light on, on the page. The Satlax house is here. The existing shed garage is here. You can clearly see that it's closer to the blue property line. That's the outline of, of the uh, Four East Grand property. This is the orange is the proposed building, and this yellow over here is the existing structure. This orange here is the 10-foot right-of-way and how it abuts the property line of the Four East Grand property. Just to try to clarify some of the things that you can't pick out. Just to try to clarify some of the things that you can't pick out maybe as well off the point on the screen. I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has for me at this time. Is, is the existing uh, building a house or a garage? It's a garage. It's a garage. So there's no house on the lot. There's, this is the house. Oh, okay. You can see it on the big screen, on the side screens. That, that is that is the main dwelling. This was an accessory building that was placed illegally, and for which we we uh, issued a, a, a letter of uh, non-action on, but would not allow it to be improved or or changed in any way until it met setbacks. They have proposed a plan that we deem meets the setbacks. And therefore, that's why the permit was issued. Mr. Longstaff, are you still up there? Can you point to the line that was the sideline that cannot act as frontage, in your opinion? <clears throat> this line between the, the Satellite property and Fort East Grand. Okay. Thank you. I think Mr. Jones is, is, is uh, trying to allude to the fact that because the 10-foot right-of-way touches it down here, this entire property line now has to have a 30-foot setback, on it, which I feel is unreasonable. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the board? Seeing none, would open it up to public. Any comments from the public on this?
Just state your name and address if you can, please. Just gotta pull the mic. Down. Yeah, pull it down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Christine Maiden. My parents along with my family friend Dr. Arcan are the owners of 4 East Grand Avenue. First, I want to thank you for the opportunity to read this statement that was prepared by my parents, Pamela Donaroma and Daniel Hayden, the co-owners of 4 East Grand Avenue. They regret that they're not able to be here tonight due to a prior commitment that they could not. Four years ago, along with Dr. Karen, we purchased our dream home, our second dream home, we purchased our dream second home at 4 East Grand Avenue. The property included a main house and an accessory building that was being used for storage. We planned on converting the accessory building into usable livable space, living space by adding insulation and a bathroom. At the time of the purchase, our real estate agent, the seller and his agent, and the local building inspector did not disclose to us that the accessory building was not in compliance with the town's regulations regarding proper setback distances. A key reason in deciding to purchase the property was the accessory building and its potential for improvement. Our neighbor witnessed the construction of the accessory building by the previous owner and may have known of compliance and permitting issues at the time, but did not file a complaint with the town, only after learning of our plan did he raise an objection. As a result, we were notified in a letter from the town zoning administrator, Brian Longstaff, that we could not modify the accessory building in its current location. However, if we moved the building to bring it into compliance, we could make desired changes. In that letter from Mr. Longstaff, dated April 10, 2015, he writes, If you should wish to move forward with any plans to improve or modify the structure, or change its use to habitable space, we will first need to relocate the structure in compliance with the town setbacks, lot coverage, and all other space bulk and use standards. To that end, we hired an engineering company, a surveyor, a designer, and a builder. We submitted plans for design and placement of a new structure on the property so as to bring it into compliance with the setback rules and all other requirements of the town of Scarborough. We have invested a substantial amount of money in surveys, planning, and designing so that the new building would meet all town building requirements. We have revised plans as needed at considerable cost make sure that the building was correct and in compliance with all of Scarborough building requirements. Having met all requirements, the town issued a building permit. Our neighbor has objected to this project at every step of the way and continues to do so today, which is why we are here. We do not believe that the objection of our neighbor is valid. The issuance of a building permit by the town of Scarborough is evidence of that. We are asking the town to uphold its original decision and allow us to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any others that would like to speak? <clears throat> please state your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Roy Karen. I'm uh, Grand. Thank you. I'm one of the owners of the property at Forge Grand. My co owners are my very close friends. We get along well was a very influential factor when we agreed to share in the purchase of our property in May of 2014. Yet soon after, when my co-owners, their extended family, and I spent our first few days together at the house, I realized this presented a challenge for me that I had not anticipated. See, I've lived alone for the last 22 years and found it difficult adapting my solitary lifestyle to one which requires spending considerable time with others and coordinating routine daily activities <coughs> such as showering, eating, watching TV, But the existence of a shed on our property offered a solution to my need for solitude on those occasions that being with the co-owners and others became overwhelming. Unfortunately, we did not realize the existing shed could not be made livable in its current location. We subsequently learned, however, that by moving it elsewhere on our property and meeting all the town's performance standards, we could convert it into an accessory unit. After consulting with several knowledgeable individuals, it became clear that instead of moving the shed, 
we would be better off simply constructing a new accessory unit whose footprint was no larger than the shed it replaced. We expected to have initiated that process sooner, but we were forced to reorder our priorities due to the urgently needed repairs within the main house. Our planning for the accessory unit thus began in earnest towards the end of June of last year. During this phase, I also began communicating the evolving plans for our property with our neighbor at 2 East Grand Avenue. This included at least six separate communications with him, of which three were direct face-to-face. -face. He expressed a variety of seemingly endless concerns, including, but not limited, to those about the property line between our two properties, the anticipated timelines for construction, how the accessory unit would be used and by whom, the effects, if any, of possible runoffs, the location of the accessory unit's parking space, his privacy, the town's regulations regarding accessory units, and even questions about the unit's siding, window placements, and interior floor plans. Yet not once in all these communications did he ever raise the issue that is the basis of his appeal. I assured him that our motivation for building the accessory unit was driven primarily by my desire to have personal space, and its use would be exclusively for family members with the number of occupants limited to just two. But my assurances did little to assuage his concerns, as was obvious by his email to me of July 20th, 2017, in which he stated, we understand that your current intention for the use of an accessory unit may be modest. <coughs> Future owners, however, may want to rent an accessory unit to multiple users, creating the potential for all the problems associated with the intense utilization of a small lot with limited setbacks and limited parking. Who are these future owners? They are my co-owners, two daughters who value and respect our property as much as we do. When they ultimately inherit it, which I hope will be many, many years from now, they will, as we have done, comply with the town's performance standards for accessory units. By validating your original decision to grant a building permit for our proposed unit, you will be enabling us to continue using and enjoying our property as we originally intended when we purchased it. Thanks. Thank you. Any others wishing to speak? Can I ask a, can I ask a gentleman a question? Sure. Uh, sir, I'm a little confused as to what you were asking the town for. Were you asking for an accessory unit, or were you asking for a unit that is accessory to the property, to the building? I believe what we are asking for is an accessory unit. Um, Mr. Chase, is it? what you understood the situation to be? Uh, I believe that's what the building permit is based on, is the application for an accessory unit. Correct. So that's what the Not a unit is. accessory to it, but like a standard accessory unit we used to approve here at the board. Correct. And now right. is that as, as defined by the town, a place where someone could live independently of the, uh, of the primary. And uh, turned over to the administrative. Well, that's been turned over about mm -hmm. a year now to administration to make that decision. Correct. correct. Yep. And the house, the, the lot we're talking about, the unit, is a unit inside of the envelopes, so it wouldn't, under the assumption that Mr. Longstaff says there's no front setback, it would be inside the envelope, that's why it wouldn't have to come here. Correct. It would so be it's basically two events almost. It, it's a unit that to be moved to get it into compliance. It's more, more nearly in compliance, or in compliance mm -hmm. so it wouldn't come here. And it's an accessory unit to be used as defined by the town so it wouldn't come here. So the issue is really comes down to just one thing. Is there any such thing as a front street? Can you have a lot without a front street? That is the front only street. question before this board this evening is, is the zoning administrator's interpretation of this lot correct, that it has no front yard? And that's the only question before this board, correct? Thank you. Yep. Thank you for both of you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Mr. Longstaff, I have a question for you. I know the only thing we've been talking about is just the front 
setback or the front yard. One of the people that just spoke referred to it as a shed, but you had said it's more like a garage or something. How big is this that was uncompliant and without compliance rather? That's there now. Dimensions are, yeah, remind me, yes. I'm not sure. 16 by 20. 16 okay. by 20. So it's a pretty good size. That's okay. the shed size, and that's exactly <coughs> the size of the accessory building. Wouldn't you just speak on the mic if you could? He just can't hear you. 16 by 20, is that what you're Yes. And her name. Just state your name and address, please. Um, Monica Dominac, um, 671 Auburn Street, Portland. Uh, I was the designer on the project, and um, the building size is exactly the same size as the shed that was in non-compliance because we were going to move the shed, but the contractors all told us it would be, you know, uh, beneficial for us to not use that shed, just to build new and take the shed down. Um, and. Um, so, um, and it's 16 by 20. Okay. Um, so I don't know if there was any other questions about that. That's the only question I have. Yeah. Thank you. Open it up to the board for any questions of? I, I still have questions for the board. Of the I do not, I would say I'm just, really at the discretion of the chairman as to where we proceed from here. Okay. As, as spelled out in section. So the question to staff was, in, in, uh, um, you know, what's the, the sort of procedure moving forward? And as section 5, C3 spells out um, that, you know, each, each side, the appellant and, and the zoning administrator shall be... Um, uh, shall present their case uh, to maintain orderly uh, procedure. Each side shall proceed uh, without interruption. Questions may only be asked through the chair. All persons asked at the hearing shall abide by the orders of the chair. At the discretion of the chair, rebuttal may be permitted by a person present on any testimony. Um, so it's at the discretion of the chair okay. as to how we proceed. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I would allow you to ask the questions, but please ask them to the board. And then we can have Mr. Longstaff come up and oh, rebut any questions for you. No, I, I will ask questions to the chair. Okay. But, I mean, I, I think under Title 30-A, state or state law, has the right to cross-examine the decisions within the kind of field from the board. So I just want to make sure that I'm clear on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, um, this is a two-story. I mean, I know there's been questions about what, what's being built. I'm not sure. You know, I don't want to get off track here, but it's a two-story. It's not a shed that's just getting moved over. It's a two-story building now. You know, it's maybe the same size, but it's an expansion of a non-conforming use. So if we want to get into that, into that we can. But 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 the but the real issue is, it's only being moved 16 feet from the front lot line rather than 30 feet, and that's really. The issue that they're not complying with the setback because the code enforcement officer's decision saying this lot has no front lot line, therefore we're going to give it a bigger building envelope than a conforming lot. So my question to the code enforcement officer um, is whether he agrees with me that the building envelope for this non-conforming lot is actually larger than it, than it would be for a conforming lot in the same zone. Do you want to just ask all your questions now, and then we can have Mr. Longstaff answer it? Okay. The second one is if he agrees that under the yard front definition, once once it's determined uh, where the front lot line is, that it the, the, under the ordinance it states that it extends for the full width of the lot. That even though it touches only 10 feet of the front lot line, the lot under the definition of yard front, it says that once you determine that, it extends for the entire width of the lot. And I'd like him to confirm that as well. Can I ask a follow-up question, Mr. Chair? Sure. Is that the end of your question, sir, or do you have another one? Um, I would like, the last, my last question would be for him to explain what he means in his last paragraph in his memo to the board 
when he when he says that the staff agrees that in the case of some type of right of way or travel easement that was in existence and used prior to any ordinance requirements and which provided an actual yard front as defined, the front yard setback would be applied. However, in this case, the means of access to the subject property does not provide a front yard, and therefore the front yard setback cannot be established. So my question is, what does he mean how this is different than, than, than when he states for the first example, how is this different, and what does he mean by means of access? I mean, this is a right-of-way that it's not 50 foot wide, but the right of way that's traveled uh, by car and is it, used by both properties. So I don't know what he means by means of access that differentiates this case from the case of these sites above, which would require a, a 30 foot setback in this case. Okay, great. Are those all your questions? Thank you. If you could hang up, just hang out right there for a minute. We want to have members of the board may, may have some questions on your three okay. questions. Yeah, but my question for you is around the definition of a street. And definition of street, as described here, says that for the purpose of meeting the street frontage and access requirements for this ordinance, the term street shall mean only a public way, a uh, private way approved by the planning department under section uh, IXI of this ordinance, or a street approved by the planning board under the town Scarborough subdivision regulations. Okay? But it also says underneath that, for the purpose of determining required setbacks under this ordinance, including setbacks for corner lots, the term street shall mean any of the above and shall also include any right of way which is described in a deed or plan recorded by the Cumberland County Registries of Deeds, right? right? Based on that, where that 10 foot property or right of way connects into the front of or the edge of the property, is it written in the deed that it's connected? Oh, absolutely. Okay. That's on their plan. That's their only access to the property. So that's a deeded 10 foot right of way without a doubt. Okay. Um, and I provided um, my client's deed that shows that same 10 foot right of way, but that, that's on their plan. They've had a survey. I mean, um, that's a deeded right of way for that 10 feet. That's how, that's the only, their only access that goes across my client's property. Okay. Um, and that's the same access that, that abuts both properties. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? No, Mr. Longstaff. Mr. Longstaff, can you please answer the same question that I just asked? What is the your interpretation of the 10 foot right of way connection mm -hmm. to that mm -hmm. owner's property? The 10 foot right of way does provide access for the owners of 4 East Grand past the satellite property to their property. The easement, the deeded right of way, if you will, stops at that shared property. It does not continue along. True, but that shows as the connection point to their property, yes. and it is in the deed that it shows that that yes. connection is their yeah. connection point. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. As to the question of is this giving this lot a bigger yard size or yard area or buildable area than any other lot, it all depends on the size of the other lots. Um, just because it doesn't have a front yard setback, yes, it's bigger than if you took the same size lot and applied front yard setback. Absolutely. I think anybody would agree that math makes good, it makes sense. I'm not sure what the point is. Um, what was the second question? Anybody know? The second question, I believe, was a bigger structure. The yard front definition. Has to do with the definition of the front yard uh, yep. follows the full width yep. of the lot? Yep. Um, it, is, it is true that yard front in our definition, I believe I provided that, is an open, unoccupied space on the same lot with the building between the front line of the building and the front line of the lot and extending the full width of the lot. Again, one would have to determine a front line. I argue there is no front line meeting front meeting our definition of front yard. <coughs> One of the reasons I come up with that is that we also have a definition for lot lines, and that says the lines bounding a lot, wherever a lot abuts a street, the side line of the street on the side abutting the lot shall constitute the lot line. What you see, the end of that 10-foot right-of-way is not a side line of a street. It's an end line of a street, if you will. It's not a side line. And therefore, you can't apply a front yard setback to it unless you apply it to 10 feet of width because it's not providing uh, a right-of-way 
true output is for the full width of the lot, which is why that definition says for the full width of the lot. You can't on a regular road or any road just apply half of the frontage of, of that lot and say, there's my frontage. You know, it's, it's obviously going to be from sideline to sideline. And third question. Third one was explaining your last paragraph, how mm -hmm. this is different, how this means of access. And I think I means of access. So once again, which says it, where it says and which provides the principal means of access to abutting properties. So there is an abutting property on one side, there's an abutting property on the other. It only provides access to the Satlak property and to no other property beyond 40 square feet. Thank you. Mr. Loizo, did you have any other questions about the street I am determination? I'm sorry. Oh, by the way, 2 East Grand does have frontage on, on, uh, on East Grand Avenue, which is a difference. And can you point that out, please? I actually have an aerial um, here that might. Okay. Not 100% sure what you want me to point to. If you, uh, you said it was also. I, I miss maybe I misheard you. Miss, it's also fronting at two. I think what did you say? What I heard Mr. Longstaff represent. So this is two East Grand Avenue here. This is four East Grand Avenue, the uh -huh. main building. Uh -huh. This is the uh, shed structure in question, as is currently there, proposed to be moved a little bit. Mr. Longstaff just referenced that two East Grand Avenue, their frontage is yeah. here on East Grand Avenue. I yes. believe is all Mr. Okay. Longstaff was saying. Um, and then you can sort of see the driveway here, which is generally where the obviously the mm -hmm, ten foot mm -hmm. easement way is. This is tax map parcels. This isn't survey data, so sure, we, you have to take it with a bit of grain of salt. But we toggling between the two, you can sort of this gives you a representation of what we're talking. Certainly, about. The, the thing I'm struggling with is again under the definition of the street. It says for the purpose of meeting the street frontage and access requirements, it states the three items, and then it says for the purpose of determining required setbacks under this ordinance, including setbacks for corner watts, the term street shall mean any of the three above. Also include any right of way which is described in the deed. The only way this would be described in a deed that doesn't travel through it is that connection point of 10 feet, right? So that, I guess that's what I'm struggling with. I know it doesn't travel through the property, but the only reference to it will be at that connection point so how can it, in my opinion, how, can it, how else can it be described from frontage on that property except the only connection from this definition, the street frontage, has to be that 10-foot connection? My argument is that yeah. right-of-way is deeded. That, that right-of-way provides them access. It's not their property. It's, it's just theirs to use to get to their property. And so obviously you can't stop two feet from the property line and jump over to your property. It has to connect. Correct. I'm and, not and but this I'm doesn't say that that, that create a sideline or a frontage. Right, but the, but this statement around street doesn't say that it has to travel through the property. It just it, says also include any right away which describes in a deed or plan, and the only description is that connection point of the ten foot line that touches that property. Yes, but Mr. Loisel, it does say that it has to serve abutting properties, abutting properties, not just one property, but abutting properties. And I interpret that to mean that that. Right of way, whether it's 10, 15, 20 feet, doesn't matter, has to go, has to act and behave like a public street would behave, like a private. But road since it only touches behave. one other property, you're saying it doesn't meet it because it's not two or more properties that that Well, fights? it doesn't go through the property to provide frontage for another running property. It just stops dead at the property. But haven't they proved they've been using that as a right of way or a street by traveling I'm not around? Arguing that. Can I jump in here? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Mr. Longstaff, if we had a property that, let's take this off the table. It's a property and it's not 200 feet wide, whatever, and in the middle of it is a right of way and it's allowed to be 60 feet on each side to be able to build this tool. It's for sake of discussion. Mm -hmm. And there's a right of way that cuts through that property to get to the back property. The sideline setback, we be the same side that setback has required. The right of way does not make a sideway setback, correct? The right of way does make a no. The right of way creates frontage. Does the right of way make a set? Does it, is it, is there, the right of way create the 
and what I'm trying to establish, I guess, or figure out in my head, is to me, if you've got a right of way that's coming through your property for CMP, for the sake of discussion, my lot line is still my lot line. It's just a right of way that's going right. through my property. Yes, I agree with that. What is the difference between a right of way that's allowed for CMP and a right of way for allowed for traveling on the road? Is there anything? What's the difference? I guess, to me, a right of way is not a setback at all. It's just a opportunity to be able to pass through somebody's property. However, I, I just offer that the, so, but the definition does clearly state, uh, and I'm under the definition of street, it talks about for purposes of determining required setbacks of this ordin ordinance, um, the term shall mean any of the above shall also include any right of way which is described in the deed which provides print, and I'm skipping some verbiage, uh, which provides principal means of access to the abutting property. So I think in your in your example there about a right of way for for um, uh, uh, CMP to run yeah. the power lines, that's not a principal means of access. This okay. is really talking about a principal means of access right away, which no one disagrees or is arguing that that ten foot wide right away that crosses. I don't believe anyone's arguing it. <laughs> uh, that crosses uh, to East Grand Avenue. The Satlac property is the means of access um, to Lot Four. Um, it then the question just becomes, as already been articulated, since that right of way stops at the property line, how then do you define a a, a front yard? Obviously, Mr. Longstaff has determined in his in his estimation that. There is no front yard for the host of reasons he spelled out. Uh, the SATLAC and their uh, representative have indicated that because the right of way stops at that property line, it is then therefore that property line, and now I'm talking about the property line between the SATLAC and uh, 4 East Grand Avenue, becomes the, the front yard. Um, you know, it, and so the question is. It, is that the right interpretation? Is the interpretation uh, that, sure, every yard needs to have a front yard, and since the the, the, terminate, the, the 10 foot access easement terminates at that corner, it, do you make a, and the ordinance talks about, it extends the full width of the lot that's already been referenced, does that mean you sort of project that 10 foot easement straight across the front of 40 foot? Uh, front, I should make sure to use that one. <laughs> Just uh, directly towards the ocean, I should say, and you know, sort of along its pathway, if you will. That it's natural progression towards the shed, right, right? Right. And and I'm not, you know, I'm just sort of yeah. trying to articulate. And again, and it, it's been referenced in our our, our own town attorney's uh, memo to the board that you know there really isn't, you know, a true clear answer that you know that this is. Very much up to interpretation, and, and so. Um, Mr. Yeah, because we have the screens right now. Yeah. I'm looking at them. Mr. It looks like it extends a little bit further, but it just stops right there, right? I think right. that I think that's just the gravel. The easement, yeah, the easement legal stops standpoint. from right. a legal determination. Right. right, the easement stops. Now their gravel driveway may continue on, and yeah, I, right. So but, that stops right there. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Thank you. Um, I'll have to come back to it. Okay. Strong step, so, yes. I just offer that, that as a comparison, whenever we do a private way or any any private road as part of the subdivision or just a private way to access a back lot, we don't approve it to just hit that back lot. We require frontage to be created. In other words, if the, if the district requires 100 feet of street frontage, we require that private way to extend 100 feet into that lot to create that <laughs> frontage. We do not require that all of the lines that that touches then to be extended as long as 100 feet of frontage is created or 200, whatever the case may be. We don't allow it to stop at the property because that does not create the frontage. Okay. But in this case, it does. I'm not stop saying that. I'm saying the opposite of that. In this case, it does. My, my, that's my interpretation <clears throat> is that it does not create frontage. It only hits the property line. Okay. Did you figure out your question? Yeah, I actually did, thank you. If this were to uh, decide the board decides want, they would actually come back as, say for instance, we disagreed with the, the, the uh, code enforcement officer, mm -hmm. and the same plan would come forward, it would come forward to this board as a, what kind of appeal? 
Uh, you know, at this point, I think rather than trying to muddy the waters, I think it's best that the board sort of stay focused on trying to determine what frontage is. But it would ultimately, yes, a variance would be. A variance or a, or a I believe it would be a variance. Yeah, right. um, but again, I think a variance would be the the request. I don't <laughs> know that a reduction of yard size is available. The first need to answer this question. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all we're trying to address is the front. Right. That's that's, that's the, the question. That's the question board. before the board this yeah. evening. Any other questions? One one of the other things I'm struggling with is the definition of th this right away travels to service other properties. I I think the way the intent of that would have been it would have been properties not I E S but properties with an S in the brackets, meaning one or more, because. You know, you don't necessarily put a right away in just to serve multiple pieces if there's only one property behind it. So I would have thought the intent would have been to serve the property that is behind this. So I look at properties, I E S, as the property or multiple properties that sat behind that front lot. So I'm still, I'm looking for you to help me. Come up with a different determination. And I don't, how, you know, I, I'm asking the question: Does that make sense, or do you think I'm all wet? I'd like to speak to that, Mr. Loisel. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, where I'm coming from, I look at the town, and I think it comes down to a word. It says properties. If the town wanted the definition to say access to any property, it would say any property. It says to me. I mean, I'm saying it says access to abutting properties. So I see Mr. Longstaff says, this is only access to one property. This doesn't apply. So my question so I, to you. So I interpret this as properties is strictly I, saying it has to involve more than one property. It has to be involved for this required setbacks for the purpose of this. So you're saying the right of way doesn't exist unless there's more than one property connected to Under it? Under the town definition, yes. It says properties, not property. We could look around and see multiple situations where this exists everywhere. And I, I would love someone to present us evidence. Tonight to do that, I know that's I, a, I don't know if anyone point. has. Yeah, you know, I'm wondering tonight if someone would be able to present evidence showing any consistencies as to if this is allowed, this isn't allowed, but no one has. So we're really looking at properties. To me, is what I'm looking at at this point. I'd like to see some data on that. Well, we have to evaluate the evidence that's been presented to us tonight. Ms. Longstaff, go ahead. Again, the, the section of that definition, it says, it shall include any right of way which is described in the deed. So let's break it into two pieces. Any right of way described in the deed. Okay, got that. Mm -hmm. It's described in the deed, nobody's arguing that. <clears throat> and then it says, and which provides principal means of access to abutting properties. So to me, if it doesn't go through that lot and provide access to abutting properties, it's only, only the satellite property, and they could actually use East Grand Avenue. So it's there, they're using it, but it's, it's going by their lot, and it's stopping at 4 East Grand. It's not continuing on to provide access for other properties. So it meets one of those conditions in that definition, but not the other. That's my interpretation. I mean, looking at the map, it's clear what you're saying. Any other questions? Motion. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got a question. Uh, hopefully, somebody out there can answer it. Who else uses that right away? Who uses that right away? Go ahead. Okay. I yep. can answer that. Um, my clients use it, the applicants use it, and the abutters use it to the other side. If you see, if you look at that map, you'll see. That, that driveway that that right away ends and then the driveway goes over to access the other property that's next door. Now whether they have a legal right, but I'm just telling you that if you look at if you look at the map and the driveway, they're all attached to that 10 foot right of way. So it's it's three properties that are using it and it's it's you can see it on the map. That's actually not true. That's not true. We have the public hearing closed. We can't take any more comment from the public. It's hard to say, really, looking at it. 
No, I mean, again, unless there's a deed showing that the other properties are using that as access, I, I mean, it's just a picture. I have multiple, you know, we'll drive on different driveways. Motion before the board or anything? Further discussion? I'm struggling with this as well, and uh, ultimately, again, based on the information provided before us, I, looking at the word that's in the that's in the uh, the town ordinance, property versus properties. That's kind of where I'm standing right now. Sure. Yes. Uh, my person at this point, I don't think we have enough information to make a call. <coughs> I would agree. I mean, we're looking, Mr. Lozell brought up a good point. I mean, we don't know per se. And if this does, like to your point, address any other issues in town where it does actually happen like this. That's one of the reasons why I asked the other question, is because it may be easier to just send it through the zoning board, to get it out of the way. It might save for every time. It's not one way or the other. But well, I mean, I struggle that see. these people hired an attorney, and this is the case I'm that they presented today. To and so it's. I'm just saying I don't have enough information to make a decision. So I'm, my position would be the alternatives out there for them is out of choice. I'm just making a point. Right. Uh, just I, to be clear, I, I just want to make one point that the folks at Fort East Grand Avenue do have a building permit. So they they are operating under the assumption that they can do what they want. They don't need a variance. So for them, they're, they're sitting on a, a permit approved by our code enforcement offices. It's the appellants who, have, who are um, bringing forth to this board asking if the code officer has erred in his judgment. So I think if there is additional evidence, that's certainly within the board's rights to ask, request that. Um, and I think it would be good to give clear uh, guidance to the appellants as to what that evidence is that you're seeking. Um, so, because I, I don't know that it was entirely clear to me um, what the what the request was, and, and maybe it's clear to others until. Yeah, I mean, looking at this, if we decided to table this, I don't know if we can table it or not, but they gotta would they have to stop building with that building permit? I think Mr. Longstaff may have uh, be able to. <clears throat> the appellants actually have the right to execute that permit is what I understand. Obviously, they don't want to do that until they know that, that the appeal has failed, okay? But I want to clarify one thing. To me, they've made their case. Your job is to determine, did I make an error or not? If you can't decide that tonight, I don't know what tabling it is going to do for you. I don't know that they can come back with any more information. I don't know that I can. You just, it, the main municipal association puts it this way, tie goes to the runner. If they haven't clearly proven their case and you still don't know for sure, then you have to side with me because you have no other, other recourse. Um, if, if you feel they've proven their point and I'm in error, then you should rule in their favor. I don't think it's fair to table it and send them back. I don't know what you're gonna request for additional info. If you don't have enough to do it tonight, I think there's a, you know, I think you need to do that. I think you need to make a decision. Can you help if, us out with the semantics if, of property and properties, which everybody seems to be stuck on? Because the the, other, the appellant's saying it does go to two additional properties. They didn't prove that tonight, they though. Right. Prove that. I understand that. I, 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 when, think that the, I think that the appellant has provided you with plenty of information. I think I've provided you with plenty of information. I think the ordinance is sufficiently ambiguous to create a, a, a question mark on this, which we will note and correct the next time we make amendments. But for tonight, I think you've got the information you need. I don't, I don't know what table is actually going to do. That's so when you issued this, your, your point of issuing this was, you looked at it and it just extended that one property. It didn't go over to add any other properties to I'm it. I'm just looking at it as not creating furnish support. Okay. Okay. Plain and simple. And if I can, I think that the last point, or maybe the second to last point that Mr. Longstaff made is the relevant one that, again, our town attorney reviewed this and said this is sufficiently you know, ambiguous and vague. It, you know, this is strictly up to interpretation. Um, there's really, you know, is there a right and wrong answer? The courts may ultimately be the deciders, but right now, it's this board is is sitting in judgment, um, and then whatever your decision is may or may not wind up before a superior court who will look at the 
ordinance and make their own uh, determination, but at this point, it's... it's so we're trying board. to evaluate Mr. Longstaff's interpretation of... Uh, you're actually trying to evaluate the appellant's case. Okay. Um, it's, it has, you know, again, it does, it, and that, we don't need to okay. go around that again. But Mr. Maroon, you had another question? Well, we seem to be following the ICC code in the, in the town for, start, for setbacks, for uh, roads. Yeah, what was the definition there? But yard is a little bit different. This is what yard says, and I'm not sure that is not the same code. Is uh, front yard a yard extending across the full width of the lot, the depth of which is the minimum horizontal distance between the front lot line and a line parallel thereto. This is different. It says I, I think it's important that we stay interpreting the town zoning ordinance. Yeah, which just. I don't disagree, but we are challenged with it. Which, with says, comments, which so. says an open, unoccupied space on the same lot with the building between the front line of the building and the front line of the lot and extending the full width of the lot. That's front yard. But, but a front yard is not a front, necessarily a front uh, setback or side of the front boundary. Yard is, I don't know the follow. The front yard is necessarily a front boundary, but he's trying to say is the front yard the house's position defi defined by the front of the building. So I think that's that's sort of one of the the questions is is a front yard determined by having a street or is it truly the orientation of the house? And this was actually a discussion we had sort of early on. Um, is when Typically, administratively, when someone comes in for a building permit to the town and they're in uh, R4 zone and they're required to have 100 feet of frontage um, with a 30-foot with a setback, when they submit a building permit, we don't ask which door is your front door. We say, if you're, here's your street, that's your 30-foot setback. Um, and so I think that was, so as, as this started to get looked at and said, okay, if that's, that's how we typically administrate it, then this lot, it, you know, again, at Brian's determination, having no street frontage, sort of said, okay, there is no street frontage meeting that definition, so therefore everything's just a side yard, because if there's no front, there's no rear, then everything's just a side. Same could probably be said for the existing house. And the same question would be if the street connects to a property, does that determine the front yard? Depends. And then could if it's angled. I guess I'd open up to the board for any further discussion or motions. I would just I've got a I've I've got a a question that it's really got nothing to do with the, the front yard as, as such is is the complaint about the building is it because it's too close to the quote unquote front yard or front line yes no okay wait a minute if, if that's the case, if that's the case, if the building was just moved back another 15 feet or so, my understanding is there's already been construction started, right? No. No, no. no. okay. I don't believe there All has right. been anyway. A permit's been issued, but I don't believe okay. work has started. And it's not a decision to move turn it permit to tell them to move it back. It's our determination to find out if the frontage exists, right? Right. So your determination, your, your, the board's actions tonight would either be to, again, it would be to affirm the building permit that the uh, zoning administrator has um, uh, interpreted the ordinance correctly, to uh, reverse the um, zoning administrator's uh, determination uh, based on the SATLAC representation that Truly, the, the front setback should be determined um, at basically that property line where the where the uh, easement terminates, or you could modify the discussion and 
you know, the board could determine where that front setback is. Is it the continuation of that right away? Um, and do we have a, you know, so that, that's ultimately the board's three actions. And I will just note that um, as I was just gonna sit tonight to help support the board in, in making your determination, um, when I spoke with our town attorney, the one thing that he did um, highly recommend for this board to consider when you do make a motion, to be sure that that motion includes at least a few sentences as to why you're making your determination, um, whether that's, you know, what, what evidence has been provided or that there's evidence in this letter or that letter that helps support your determination. Because um, without sort of stating your rationale, the, the courts may just turn it right back to you and not even consider the case and just require you to make, make, take action. So that's why I think we're all struggling with yeah. this because we don't, I know at least three of us don't feel we have enough information. Mm -hmm. okay. But where do we go with that? All right. If there's, if there, if I would suggest again, as I said, if you, you know, if, if the board has, if there's information that you feel you need, and you can clearly articulate what that information is, that's I think completely, you know, it's spelled out in the ordinance that if there's more evidence that the board needs, then you can table the item for further discussion. But it'd be helpful to know exactly what that information is. Um, and the town attorney didn't address that at all. If we came to a determination that we had to table it, <coughs> because we didn't have enough information. You don't have to table it. You can okay. again. It's yeah. I don't think tabling it would serve either party in this case. Right. Um, I agree. We need to come to a decision to this on a decision. A decision on this tonight. Excuse me. Um, from the evidence that is here before me in the packet tonight, I don't believe the interpretation that there is a front yard. Um, and I agree that the dirt driveway does not create frontage. That's, that's my thought. Can I get others' thoughts on that? I mean, clearly I'm in, agree I'm in agreement with James. Um, I think that, you know, I, th I also think it's unfair to the folks who have been issued their building permit to for their be prolonged because of the appeal that was brought in. I mean, this is it. This is your hearing. They brought their appeal. If you don't feel you have enough information, then shame on the appellant for maybe not giving enough information. But I mean, in a court of law, it's a one-time presentation. All the evidence is given. I think it's been given, and I think it's only fair for these people to be able to move forward. Um, I think giving the testimony that the town, Brian, has given. I think we have enough information to reaffirm. Pardon it. Yes, please. Mr. Chair, would it be I was just going down. Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to ask you if there's acceptable left to come back and speak because I don't know that they've really spoken that much. Yeah, I was just going down, kind of gathering an opinion mm -hmm. of the board. Okay. To see where we're at. To me, there's a simple solution. Just move the proposed building back. Satisfies everybody. You know, we're going to argue about technical <clears throat> definitions of a street and a side yard and everything like that. Well, if you can move the building back, move the building back. Can well, you move the building back? No, we can't. No. Why? They'll hit the house, right? Well, I can't. I, I can't tell from a picture. I, I guess what I'm asking right now for your opinion is: Do we have enough information to determine? Brian's decision, Mr. Longstaff's, or do we not? That's basically all I want was yes or no answer. Do we do we or don't we, in your opinion? Yeah. Yes, for Yeah, we got enough information. For upholding what Mr. Longstaff's decision was? Or reversing it? Well now you're asking Affirming. for my opinion. No, you asked well, do we have enough information? Yes, we have enough information. I haven't made up my mind yet. Okay. Mr. Murray. Um, I'm just going to, I don't have enough information yet, but I think it's there. I'm struggling as well. I have an opinion on a different angle. And again, I'm just trying to get options. To me, the answer would be in, in common sense land. Where do they go in the house? Because that's usually the front. Okay. Well, 
that building itself, just that unit, does not have a front door or entrance on the quote unquote front side. It's on the right hand side or in the rear side. So to me, it comes down to, if you want to make it quick and dirty, there, the, the home has decided where the front is. And the front actually is probably, if anything, it's over on the porch side. Just for a point of reference, Mr. Maroon pointed out this piece of paper over here, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, right, if you're looking at the, to me, the home kind of determines what, what it is, right? I mean, if you look at the small unit, the small unit shed. Are you talking about the entryway to the small unit? Or right, or? the entryway to the small unit. Okay. It's not on the quote unquote side that would be considered. Um, this side? Right. It's in the. It's actually either on the left hand at the bottom or on the right, one of the other. And it looks like it would be considered either both. And if you look at the house, it's the same kind of thing. It's that circular area. And based on it, I, 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 I think Mr. Longs, that's right. I mean, it, the center is really the the front. There is no front. If you wanted to argue the front, I'd argue the back here, like most seasonal properties, would be the front because that's the view. If it's camp, right? And you're looking at the, look the water. Your front is not your backyard. It's the front yard, right? I mean, if this this is a property in the water or in, in ocean area, where are you going to look? Out the back, looking at East Granny, you look at the at the the, you know, the tree and look at the, the water. My opinion is you're probably going to sit on that deck, and that's your front yard. It's not a back deck. It's a that's my front yard if I'm living there. So I don't. I have to come up with a way to define what front yard is. And I think you have to take it out of the, the neighborhood thing, and you have to put it into the second home category. If you live on a second home, and I have a second home, I've had many second homes in my life, the front is not the part where my car is. The front is where I spend my time. It's the front side of the house. I think, that, I think if anything, the front is actually, if I was probably the front, I'd say there are two, here and here. Here for this property, and here for this property. So I don't and I think it's long set correct. That's kind of your finding with that. Um, right. I agree, Mr. Maroon. Any motion for? I'd like to move to affirm the town's position on this building permit, uh, mm -hmm. based on I don't believe that the interpretation that there is a front yard and that the driveway does not create yard frontage. Does that spice what the lawyer wanted us to affirm it on? Yep, you, the attorney said it could be, what, just wanted to be sure you articulated your rationale, and I heard two two reasons stated in that motion, so I, I hope that would work. <laughs> I guess the courts will decide if, if it gets that far. I mean, we, I, don't, <laughs> I don't have to reiterate what Mr. Longstaff said. He's already read, read it into yep. record, and it's been written into record with the town's notes. Any second? I'll second the discussion. All those in favor? And Mr. Longstaff did made the right decision. What's happening? We're voting to affirm the town's position. You guys also. Yeah, I, it kind of jumped on me. Um, I think we need to clarify my comments. I, I, I didn't know we were going to jump that fast on. I, I was. We were talking about his comment about his lakefront property. If okay. you look at my deed, I, I was going to ask Mr. Chase, but if you look at my deed on the lakefront property, okay, it, the back side where the where the right of way is is my backyard, but that's my front door. <laughs> my front yard is on the lot. So I guess I'm trying to reaffirm the point that I'm making. Which is front yard is very, very, very subjected to, to interpretation. Because legally, my, I have a plot plan, pull up in a second, and it shows my backyard is where the front of my house is. But nobody in a property like that would consider that your front. So I guess I'm just trying to reaffirm it and to close the door on it, as opposed to kind of just saying, yeah, I can't throw it in the air. But I mean, I can show a deed that, that would show that. I don't know what the town's rules are, though. Mm -hmm. so I know what Naples is. I don't know what Scarborough is. And my point was that's the best argument I've heard. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. Yeah, I did ask what you're finding a fact on that, if that would have... Is, is Mr. Chase going to be on that as far as what the town... 
can, is there, does Scarborough have a definition like that? A uh, front yard? I think we... No, I mean, we've what, I mean, what I mean by that is, what I mean by that is, if it were a camp, front front yard. Or a property our, on our, the water. Our definition, these are our definitions. You've, okay, so you've read them. There's, awesome. there's nothing, <laughs> there's, there's no other like hidden uh, like shoe here. <laughs> yeah. That's the challenge. I mean, it enables us to find. And you said that did affirm Mr. Longstaff's decision. In, in my view, contrary to, it, without any other information, if I'm going to argue the position of what is the definition of a front yard, it's where the house determines that. I, it, it, under the assumption that we've got the exact problem we have, where the heck is it? We're all looking at it. We have relatively intelligent people here, between the attorneys, the owners, the, us, the town. We've got a fairly good group of people trying to figure this out. So then you have to fall back to what is the house? What does the house think? Well, the house defines itself as the front being where you live your life and the back being where you happen to be driving in, but that's the back side of the house. And that's, I guess, my argument, and that's the logic that we're using. So are you two okay for a vote now? I'm okay. And so you heard the, can you repeat the motion? Me? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay, so. <laughs> Um, I'll repeat my motion. I move to affirm the town's position um, in giving them the building permit uh, based on I don't believe that the interpretation uh, that there is a front yard and I agree that dirt I agree that the dirt driveway does not create yard frontage. And is there a second? That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Okay. All those in favor of affirming the decision? All those opposed? Passes. Five. Four. Four, yes. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Happy to do it. Okay, so this one is table. Okay. Okay. I didn't put this. I did. This one is table. What are we doing? The first one. We're done with that. This one? Yeah, we've already done these. Oh, those two were together. We yeah. Three for me. And then this one we just did. This one is table. So we can just let them know that item okay. appeal number two. And then we'll move on to appeal number two. Okay, six. Right. Thank you. I've never seen this. Wait for Mr. Longstaff to join us again. Thank you, folks, for your comments. We're not signing anything. We're not signing anything. Okay. No, because that's just going to be a letter telling the applicants they were there. Gotcha. gotcha. Appeal number 2622, a variance appeal request by Anthony D'Amico, 93 Sperling Road, Assessor's Map R100, Parcel 1 has been tabled. With that being said, we'll move on to appeal number 2623, practical difficulty variance request by Ingrid Grisick. Grisick, 28 Driftwood Lane, Assessments Map U21, Parcel 106. Is there anybody here to talk on the behalf? Mr. Please, Richmond. Please state your name and where you're from. Cleared out. I don't know what's happening <laughs> there, Mike. <laughs> okay, you got one going down and one going up. So I'm going to take this. This is our last one. Yes. The first two we had to reaffirm. First two we reaffirmed. Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Magic touch. Good evening. Is that on? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, again, I forgot to uh, miss the introduction because I had to leave for a moment. My name is Mike Richmond, custom concepts architects here in Scarborough. I'm um, here on behalf of Ingrid Gressick, who's over there on the left. Family of 28 Driftwood Lane down on High Hook. Uh, after that discussion, I sat through my time with the open to the point, <laughs> so please bear with me. Um, the Dressick family has owned this property since the early 1980s. 
portions of the property over the years have fallen into uh, some disrepair. And like many properties on Pine Point, the cottage was built uh, well before prior zoning standards, and it makes it really challenging for us to make any improvements without some relief from the town. So this particular lot is... No, it's not there, Mike. So no just pull that around. No This particular lot is uh, quite long, it's dead flat, and it has a very long building wing. So I tried to use some colored sharpies here to illustrate this. The light blue is the property lines, the purple would be under current setbacks. The green are the two existing structures. Right now there's an existing cottage, 24 foot by 24 foot, and it is an existing shed. And the orange is my interpretation of a large very large depth off the second floor. <coughs> so the Gressics have asked me, oops, have asked me to develop a design to provide more bedrooms and living spaces for the growing family to use throughout the year. Uh, given the unique layout of the site and the structures, I've worked with them for almost a year and a half uh, to try to develop a plan to meet their needs. Uh, for several different reasons, we decided to maintain the existing foundation. It seems to be in fine shape. We've done a lot of projects on similar projects that were built, I think, by the same builder. So I think it has some good bones to it that we don't want to throw away. We've decided to maintain the majority of the first floor frame and as much of the second floor system as possible. We've also decided to maintain the shed in the back and the rear decks that are above it. Stewards and not throw away things we don't So I have consulted with Mr. Long staff several times um, on this design to trying to avoid <coughs> having to come in front of you folks. So we developed different designs, and I included one in the packet. Um, initially, we went off to the left hand side of the property. We maintained the driveway. We basically were trying to add a, at least a single car garage bay for use during the winter. Currently there isn't one. So we put that on the left hand side. But it really seemed crowded. It's a nice long lot. And we were sort of forcing it over to the left over that setback line. And we really felt it would have had a, a negative effect on the, the usual property who were here in the crowd because they lived next door. Then I tried to expand vertically which any of you who know me, we've done many, many times, so you guys don't have to see me, um, where maintain the existing portion here and go up. So we've done that a few times. In this particular case, really struggled with it because that only leaves us about 13 feet or so of depth to work with side to side if we're going to try to keep the structure there that we want to maintain. The shed, the decks, the first floor, the second floor frame. So that odd side would be really impractical for us to use. We have 13 feet to work with. We lose about six inches on one side and six inches for the other through the walls. That leaves about 12 feet. You need a hallway to get through to get to your bedrooms. That's at least three feet. You're left with spaces that are only eight foot, eight foot six. So I, we, we tried that approach, and everything I did came up with a structure that was really odd, very impractical, and would be very expensive to build because we're, we're using architects and structural window to get there. So we developed this plan that's in front of you, which I'll briefly go over. Sort of as a clear and, and practical approach to, to satisfy the needs. The highlights. The Gressers really desire to have a garage. It doesn't have to be big. We provided, or hopefully providing, a single 23 foot deep garage on the right hand side of the home. We propose to permanently remove the large deck sticking off the front of the house, which is pretty big and sticks out. Um, it's really prominent. Permanently remove that and put that back. Is that in the orange now? Correct. Well, a, a portion of it. Okay. The park. Uh, 
uh, I'd like to indent the addition in from the current front of the cottage. This here are the existing conditions, just a smaller copy of what we were just looking at. This is what I'm proposing. So there's the original green box. The new, I'd like to indent that just a little bit more. And as you can see, the orange, which is that orange cap in the front, completely removed. We'd also like to take the stairs that currently go over the setback line and bend them so they're in compliance. There are wooden structures, so they're considered a portion of this, this structure. And basically make it a year-round home, similar to many other homes in the neighborhood. This is the portion of Pine Point that's really been under a transformation. So, a couple more quick things. One, one very important note. The location of this existing cottage is literally over the front setback line by just a few inches more than a setback reduction would allow. And I mean inches, and Brian and I talked about this at length. In other words, if this existing cottage happened to be just a few inches further back, we'd be asking for a more typical setback reduction, which I've gone through many times, rather than a practical difficulty. Because I know practical difficulties are not easy to obtain. So I guess I'm if we still fall into this and we're mandated to this, but just please keep in mind, we're this, literally this close to being able to have this be you know, a much simpler, simpler process. So that said, uh, I'm aware that we need to prove many items to you, but I want to discuss two in particular that we brought up during my conversations and in the letter that I received. Under the town's reading, that the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the, to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located, and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. So, first, two, two quick things. First, the need for this variance is allowing the Bressings to develop their seasonal cottage, which is permitted in the zone, into a year round home, which is also permitted in this zone. Now, yes, the existing cottage could be converted as is into a year round home, but it would not, however, allow a practical way for the Bressics to provide a home, not a small cottage, to fit their needs without some relief. In other words, if the variance is not granted, the Bressics would probably not see the value of investing the money into this cottage to make it into a home if it doesn't provide the space for their family. So in my opinion, the relief that we seek is the only practical way to allow the Grissicks to have a year-round home allowed in this zone that fits their family's needs. The second point, we're relating to the financial aspect. So we seek this relief to allow the Grissicks to expand their home with a practical and straightforward approach. What I mean by that is we propose to go straight up. Foundation's in good shape. First floor framing seems to be in good shape. So we're trying to be good stewards and just go straight up. If we're forced to comply with the step setbacks and spend a lot of design fees and construction will cost to create a more complicated structure, that ultimately will cost a lot more and offer less. If this relief is not granted, Progressives may find themselves in the unfortunate position in which they have to choose one of the following things. Number one, sell the property as is, really at a great economic loss, I would imagine, due to the condition of the cottage. Two, you can renovate the cottage as is, but not ever be able to then achieve the true financial potential that the property could offer just like all the other homes around that have transformed themselves. And the three, if it wasn't granted, we could develop a pretty complex and expensive structure that fits within the setbacks, but again, it really would not work for what they're looking for. Or well, the last item, remove the cottage completely, 
which we've done, and develop a new home design that conforms to the setbacks, setback lines. First off, that would be a challenge for us to do design-wise because of the setback, the, the building window. It's a really odd shape to work with. Um, but that definitely would be the most expensive option. So I see all of these options as a result, resulting in an economic injury over the simple approval of the request. And just one closing note, and then I'll stop. We did apply and receive approval from the DEP, just in case that's a consideration as well. To that, I'll stop talking and answer questions. <coughs> I have a couple quick questions. Sure. On your, desi your designs over there, how much from the existing to the new design, how much of that is coming down? Is it still the same where the indent comes out a little, little bit? Is that the same as what the old structure has? Yeah. So the, if I understand your question correctly, this is the front of the existing house. This is the front of the new house. Same spot. Same, same spot, same it's footprint. Straight up. Okay. How much up are you going up? We are presently, this might help a little. I wouldn't put too many of those up. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> uh, all park numbers right now, the existing peak is about 21 feet. The proposed would be around 34 foot 10 ish. Okay. How long have they owned the home for? Uh, since the early 1980s. Thank you. I have a question. Um, would you agree that if you were to redesign this into a more complicated structure, that it would not would have an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood as far as budding houses? Hundred percent, yes. Okay. Thank to you. To touch on that, are there other properties surrounding that three stories as well? Yes. In fact. I know where this house is. I'm trying to. Th I, I, I'm trying to think what the houses around it look like. It's hard to tell. I also know. Oh yeah, the I first page. See one, but I this is three. Oh, yeah, we have yeah, it on there, don't we? That one there. The house to the right is <clears throat> substantial. The one behind it was recently redone. No. Uh, I don't know the exact height. It's pretty tall. So looks like across the street yes. as well. Mm -hmm. From a, from a scale perspective, I guess, overall scale, even this, especially when seen from the side, because it still would only be 24 feet, would probably still see that on a smaller side compared to the more homes that have been Looks like the one in back might be a little bit smaller, but I'm not sure by this picture. Uh, this one here? Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the Demkowitz property, which was recently more than doubled in size. So oh, yeah. this is this is an old this is an older image. Correct. This image hasn't been updated. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's why I was trying to see if we had a more updated yeah. image. Uh, I can't get it to move. Okay. Yeah, it's much bigger now. <laughs> All right. So that's not there any longer. That's been correct. Okay. <laughs> any other questions from the board? Yeah. All right. If you could just Give us your answers to the questions. Absolutely. Like you've written. The need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Yes, it is. Would you like me to read these out loud for the record? Yes, please. Sure. Uh, yes, it is. The current location of the cottage, as well as the long, narrow building envelope, would require some type of relief from the standards if they are to expand and use their property similar to other homes in the area. Nearly half of the existing structures, structure index currently sit over the setback lines. Therefore, any type of vertical expansion would involve a variance. While there are other lots on Pine Point with similar situations, I would not consider it to be a general condition. Okay, thank you. The granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. No, it will not. In fact, I believe that approving this request would allow this property to enhance the character of the neighborhood 
as well as improve the market value of the neighborhood in a few ways. It would allow the cottage to be converted to a year-round home similar to most other abutting properties. It would allow the owner to invest in the property, knowing that they can use it long-term for their family. The current cottage is in disrepair, and the size and design of the home would certainly increase the property value of adjacent properties. The practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or a prior owner? No, it is not. This hardship and the need for this relief is due to the geometry of the lot that was created long before zoning standards. By current zoning, the location of the current structure, as well as the available building area, is such an odd shape that nearly any redevelopment of this property requires some relief from the zoning standards. The building window tapers down from 25 foot 9 on the west side to 6 feet on the east side, therefore creating a, a very odd shape to try to work with. Okay, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance? Well, no, not that I've been able to find after many, many, many tries. I spent over a year working with the owner on various designs to minimize the need for relief. However, all of our efforts kept coming back to the design submitted. I tried to design an addition with some type of tower element that only falls within the allowable building window and leaves the front of the existing cottage a portion over the front setback line in place so that we would not need any type of variance. And some of you may know I've, I've done that many times successfully. To be honest, this could be done, but it would be difficult to design this type of structure and have it fit in architecturally with the character of the neighborhood. That type of design would certainly stick out as something that was forced in the neighborhood rather than integrate into it. Um, uh, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly, nearly in conformance with surrounding properties. I think you've kind of addressed that already. And yes, I believe it will. The variance will allow us to have the house be more centered on the lot rather than tucked to one side. The driveway will be relocated to the other side of the home, creating a better pattern of driveways on that side of the road. The massing of the home would fit, fit in well with the existing adjacent homes. So, yes. The granting of a variance will not have an un unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment? No, it will not. This variance would allow the owner to hopefully provide more pervious services on the lot by removal of the large parking area and even some of the decks. Otherwise, the property would be used in the same manner as it is currently used. And the property is not located in whole or in part within a shoreline area as defined 38 MRSA, uh, 435, or flood zone as defined in the town of Scarborough's flood plant management ordinance? Nope. According to the code officer and our research on it, no portion of this lot is located in a shoreland zone or flood hazard. Thank you. Mr. Longstaff, do you have anything to add? <coughs> um, only that this is, uh, as Mr. Uh, uh, Richmond said, um, we were trying to see if we could make this work as a, a limited reduction of yard size. It's a little bit simpler to go for just a fraction over. Um, he tried twisting my arm. I didn't cave in. I said practical difficulty is how we have to do it. And uh, so this is the proper vehicle for them to, to apply for the, the type of improvements that they want. Um, it's not in a uh, special flood hazard area. It's not in the shoreland overlay district, but it is in the back dune. And that's why they applied for and received a permit by rule from uh, the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, uh, beyond that, again, it's up to the board to determine if they met the tests for these criteria uh, and to make a decision based on the information provided. Thank you. Do we have any from, anybody from the public that wishes to comment? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Back to the board for questions. Didn't we receive a letter? We did. Yes. Please. I forgot about that. Just the yeah. only one. Yeah. Sure. Um, the chair has asked me to read this in. This is from Charlotte Pryor and Randy Harrison at 29 Driftwood Lane. It says, we live at 29 Driftwood Lane opposite the Gres Gresket property at 28 Driftwood Lane. Assuming the documents we have received from the planning office represent the proposed project accurately, we have only one objection to the practical difficulty variance appeal under consideration. We ask that the proposed deck on the east side of the structure either be omitted or if there is not adequate access to the rear deck through the rear of the structure, 
the width of the deck on the east side of the structure be limited to the minimum width necessary to step outside and walk left to access the rear deck. It is difficult to identify the proposed width of that east deck from the few drawings we have seen. Measurements are not offered. However, it seems clear that the proposed deck projects eastward substantially and beyond the setback guideline. If our suggestion is accepted, it appears that substantial deck space would remain on the second floor rear and third floor of the structure. Uh, that said, we wish the Gressics good luck with the project. Thank you for your consideration. Have you had any discussions with that party? No. Only okay. I received that letter today. Okay. Um, I guess my only comment, and Ms. Gressick can stop me if, if she'd like to, they're great neighbors to all their neighbors, and we have support. We have neighbors here. Um, the, I believe that the portion in question is this portion of the proposed deck right here, to my understanding. I, I guess just to be clear, and I'm not trying to be a hard guy about it, this, this portion, this particular portion, fits within the setback. So as long as we have proper lot coverage, which we do from a DEP perspective, and I'll work, I can work with the town on the town's perspective. I mean, as, as long as we're within this purple setback, this, this can go accordion style. What about so, that slate jet out that does not fit in the setback? Yep, excellent question. The, the only reason we're trying to do this is, is I don't want to say it's really a convenience. It was actually more of a safety element that came up so that if you're coming out of this side of the door the house, you could access the back. And the only stair off this upper deck, and again, this is 10 feet up in the air, is off this side. So we want to be able to provide people just enough to get to it and connect down on the front, get, up, get down off the upper deck. So there's no way to bring that back within the purple? Well, without creating a safety hazard for walking or firemen or? We, we not in an efficient way, no. <laughs> we tried. And the, I believe that the letter came from folks across the street, which would be here. So to be honest, even if this was not there, it would not affect that view from across the street at all. Looks like technically you were further down before, or am I seeing that wrong? Well, the, the deck right now is much but it looks like it comes down, if you're talking about the across the street neighbors, it looks like it comes down more. Right? Correct, correct. Yes. It goes to the east more. So you have already brought that in. Okay. Correct. But Mr. Chairman, I, again, it is in the buildable window. Right, yeah, I was just questioning. Except for that back piece. That's that's, yeah, that's the only thing I was yeah. looking at. And I'd like to make a comment. Um, and it's, it's nice to hear that you are good neighbors, and I'm sure you'd be willing to work with them to address any problems that they would have. Uh, but... Um, with, with, regard, with regard to the neighbor who wrote in, as we've stated before in the past, you're not entitled to review as far as your, you know, if something's obstructing your property, especially if it's across the street. Um, and I see based on uh, the information provided here that the applicant, uh, and I guess speaking to point number four, working over for a year, multiple designs, has explained, at least to my satisfaction, that the applicant has explored many options uh, other options would potentially jeopardize the other requirements of this practical difficulty application, i.e., for me, it's always aesthetics and character of the neighborhood, and you would end up putting a house in there that wouldn't match anything, that neighbors would be more of an eyesore, rather, thinking of the accordion style or the cheesecake design that would have to fit in on that buildable lot. Yeah, and I would think the height, if a neighbor was going to address anything, they would have addressed the height, and no one actually addressed the height. Right. From how far it's going up. Right, and another, that's another point as well. All the surrounding homes are of that scale. So I, me personally, I don't see any significant issues with this application. Any other questions from the board? Uh, to the point of uh, Mr. Hebert, could you discuss the options that you looked at under item four for review of different designs, please? <coughs> Certainly discuss, unfortunately, visually, not much help. Other I, I know you showed a sketch of one. Yeah. Um, that was actually probably about halfway down the field, to be honest with you. The, the, 
the, the, the only approach that I was trying was basically making this rectangle that's within the purple setback line as long as possible and pulling it up as high as possible to get the bedrooms and living spaces that, they're, that they need. Um, again, could I do it? Absolutely. Can't lie. I can go up to 35 feet. But architecturally speaking, it was a really big wall with lots of windows in it. And I was having a really hard time getting my spaces in there to work inside with any type of a, a hallway. The spaces became so small that it didn't have feet ish. Mm -hmm. um, but back to the, the, the character, I'm a Pine Point guy. I could absolutely could not get it to work from a scale, from a design perspective at all. Couldn't, couldn't develop a roof that would really go on and well. And was, there, was there any other alternatives you looked besides? just that envelope that's inside the purple? Well, yes. In fact, that's one rendition is similar to this, the, the small rendition here, yeah. where I had it more on the left-hand side than the right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I worked for a couple of months in different scenarios trying to keep it here. Threw my hands up, came in with Brian again, and said, you know, if, if I can go over this, all sorts of possibilities. Mm -hmm then it really opened things up. But forcing to stay within this, I, I struggled and struggled and struggled and finally basically said I, I can't, can't come up with something that's good. So it was multiple attempts with trying to get that center portion yeah. raised and yes. try and make it work with a small weight. Yes. M months of effort. Yeah. Not continuously, but off and on. Months. Now to further Thank go you. over that question. With the properties around, if you had brought that to 35 feet, how much more would it probably stick out to the other properties, even the one that was just redone in the back? Would that make it substantially higher? Well, yes and no. Um, and kind of an odd design. So the, I guess from my perspective, the, the height of the proposed is high, similar to the one beside it, to the, to the east, similar to the one behind it. But it's actually, I'll use a bit more. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Need more tape. Yes, yeah. Need a new easel. Um, you know, this right here is a high structure, 35 feet. And there's many, many houses on Pine Point that almost reach that 35 feet. 35 feet is the limit. My opinion is if it's 35 feet in a limited portion, that's that's a great character that provides style. The problem that I was having with the other one it is if it's 35 feet the whole way, because you need that space and you only, and you have to jam it within the, the purple setback lines, it, it's a wall. It's it's way too big. It's way too much room. Would the garage have even fit in if you didn't if you were trying to get it in the? Not depth wise, no. I, the only way to get a a garage that's even reasonable, other than for a mini, would be to come in from the side. And we'd be adding a tremendous amount of driveway and permanent services to do that. I actually had a scenario with that, now that you mentioned it. Any other questions? Yes. The existing paved driveway, is that being removed? Yes, sir. Any other questions? Seeing none, should we go through the questions and just go over for the board and vote yes or no? Need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general condition of in the neighborhood. I'll step down at this end. I mean, I think the appellant's done a good job showing the narrow building envelope that they're working with here. And um, I think they've done a good job that. I agree with uh, their statement. Yeah, I agree as well. It's it's the unique cir circumstances of this buildable envelope that's requiring them to bring them here. This room? It looks like other houses don't have that problem uh, in the area. And that would be the definition, so I would agree with that. Yeah, I agree with Mr. Maroon. It looks like the two properties that are backed up to it have a similar issue, but I wouldn't say it's the general character of the neighborhood. 
And I would agree. I, th I think the lot's very restrictive. All those in favor of one being met? Unanimous. Granting of variance will not produce an undesirable change to the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. We'll start down here again. Shoot. Uh, to be honest, I'm actually familiar with the property, and I think at this point it's kind of a sore thrum, thumb in that sort of neighborhood. I think it'll be nice to, it'll just improve the character of the neighborhood and obviously the value of all the properties surrounding it. I agree. It's going to, uh, it's going to match other properties in, in the uh, neighborhood and that's it. I agree. Uh, I believe the applicant has explained to, to my satisfaction that uh, any alternative would be a complicated building design that would not meet the character of the surrounding homes. Mr. Merrill? I agree. The uh, massing of the structure is shown by the uh, applicant. Does a good job of uh, not overdoing, pushing the envelope in uh, making it too big. So the very uh, heights of the roof also uh, create a mass that's uh, in character with the neighborhood. And I agree. As per you, you presented to us, you looked at different ways, and you really didn't want to make it out of character in the neighborhood. So I appreciate that because we have some people that come in that will not make it in the character of the neighborhood. Practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or. Vote on that, Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. Yep. All in favor? Sorry. This is new stuff. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's see what we're on for. Three. Three. The practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or the prior owner. No, I mean, the original structure was built before the zoning standards, and they're just trying to now deal with what's there and expand on it. It's caused by the uh, zoning. I agree with uh, Ms. Shoup, and I have nothing to add. I agree. The uh, abutting properties to the back side of the property, those two look like they have the same problem, and uh, it is not a owner issue. It is the layout of the way these uh, properties were deeded. I would agree with all the comments of the board. All in favor of three? It's unanimous. Four? No other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Well, I think the applicant has fully gone through and showed us that, you know, there really is no feasible alternative for this lot and what their the constraints that they're dealing with. I agree with Ms. Shoup. Um, I'll reiterate briefly what I said earlier. Uh, I believe they met this and they've explained to my satisfaction that they've explored many options and they've gone through tonight. Uh, and other options for a building design would I think jeopardize requirements of this practical difficulty application with regards to character of the neighborhood. I think one of the uh, pluses is that, um, I haven't heard mentioned is taking off that back shed or the front shed, or the front porch there at the deck, which kind of balances out a little bit of the other side. So I think that's important. So that, Pulling it in from the front property, right? Then? Taking it cut off. I think that is a legitimate benefit. I believe the applicant has shown the uh, burden of proof that they've reviewed all the designs possible. Normally this is the toughest one for me, and I normally am a no on this, but it looks like you've gone to great lengths with Mr. Longstaff to try to make it happen, and you're really trying to keep it within the envelope, which I really appreciate, because you're not really going out of that border very much from where it was before, so we appreciate that. All in favor of four? Shannonis. The granting of a variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Yes, I mean, I think the applicant has shown that, you know, they're trying to be more stylistic in regards to the properties around them and trying to center it in the property, and that they're trying to work with as much of the envelope as they can. I think the, uh, the expansion that they're proposing here... Um, coincides very nicely with the other properties as you can see in the pictures. I agree. Uh, based on, uh, and I appreciate the Google image as part of the packet, um, based on the size and scale of the surrounding homes and the neighbors, that this, wouldn't, this would not be out of place. I agree as well. There are at least four or five properties that come up two and a half stories in the, uh, in the abutting positions. 
Yeah, I too appreciate the um, Google image because I was looking at the one behind and I appreciate you telling us that that has been changed because that was my one concern. That one was kind of out of place because it was smaller, but most of the others are. All in favor of five? Two unanimous. For six, granting of a variance will not have an unreasonable adverse effect in the natural environment. I believe they've shown that it will not. Yeah, it, it's not going to have any. You know, I do have one, one question. You said that you heard from yeah. DEP. Correct. What'd you ask DEP for? This lot is located in the rear view, as most of the plan is. So we're required to get a permit from the DEP as well as the town. Oh. Which you've already obtained, right? Pardon? You've already obtained that. So number, question number seven is not? Mr. Longstaff addressed that. It's not okay. going to be an It's option. not in the shorelands. Though. Right. Okay. Uh, and that spoke to my point that they've already engaged the DEP and they've given their blessing on this. So I see no issues with point number seven. Six. Agree. It was six. Sorry, six. <laughs> That's OK. All in favor of six being met? It's unanimous. Number seven. <laughs> We've already addressed it. The property's not in, located in whole part within the shoreland area. Do we need to address the dune? Mm -hmm. yeah. No. Okay. So I would see number seven. One thing I didn't ask you, normally I would ask you, on the current structure, what is it like as far as, like, the structure itself for the electrical and the plumbing and the clearances for safety reasons? Is it outdated in a lot of those? Because that's... Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, there it has... They've not done any demolition, so it's hard to have x-ray vision before, you know, through the walls. Um, it's two by four construction. Limited, if any, uh, insulation, from what I understand. You know, it's a seasonal cottage now. We shut the water off and close it down. 99% um, <coughs> of this same builder has built a couple of other projects on High Point recently renovated, and all the wiring is bad. Okay. <laughs> Suspect of what <coughs> And other safety concerns like access yeah, in and out. And I believe the bones are good. The foundation, I believe, is good. The walls are good. The structural members holding the second floor seem to be good. I'm very suspect about the, the wiring. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to go on record. Yes. I know uh, one of the abutters uh, had an issue with the right side deck and based on what I see the size and the massing of that deck I don't think it uh, you took advantage of us or and I don't think it is uh, significant so I would disagree with their position and I agree with the size of that deck on the right hand side tied with that if you're looking from where that person was talking it's in the back side of it would make a bit of difference if that deck were two feet deeper and the depth has no yeah. no impact yeah. So it wouldn't make any difference at all. And just about all of it's in conformance except that one little jut out, which you've explained the reasoning for. Yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Mr. Loisel. Um, just from an egress standpoint, that satisfies any concern that I have with that. It's a motion for the board. Uh, move to approve uh, appeal number 2623 as presented. Second. All those in favor? No discussion. Oh, okay. Any discussion? Any discussion? Uh, one comment. Um, I'd like to thank the applicant for, and you know, people make fun of colors on drawings, but I certainly <laughs> I really appreciate it, especially <laughs> looking at it from a distance. It's nice, and we've had previous applications come in as well. It's nice to have the existing, the proposed, the boundary lines laid out in a nice color coordinated pattern. It makes things much more efficient. If we could everybody use the same colors yeah. now. If you could. Purple, <laughs> green, and orange. Yeah. That's, that's, we can see those. That's why I'm saying this on the record for the millions of viewers out there, um, as well as for, for, for Mr. Longstaff to take for future recommendations. Are you saying you didn't else. like my highlighted colors on my drawing? I didn't yep. say anything about that, actually. <laughs> So, I second that. That's my call. That's my comment. So thank you. Yours more in this detail. <laughs> okay. So I guess we need to vote again. Yes. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.
should we hold our documentation for the table? Northeast. Just put everything back in your black okay. files, and I'll go through and pull out yes. what Thank you need you. to keep, okay? Okay. Any promise I'll bring more tape next time, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, I'll bring, easel might work, bring actually. easel. Yeah. He actually has an easel, but I'll bring ours. Okay, so is there any more comments? Any zoning board, zoning board comments this evening? I have a comment. Yes. Um, first, uh, congratulations, Leroy. I think you did a great job tonight. Um, as chair, and I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Maroon. Uh, you've been the chair for ever. The three, <laughs> I think, three years I've been on the board, and uh, I really appreciate all you've done. So thank you, Mr. Maroon. I was trying to con continue that. <sighs> Any other comments? Yeah, I'm ready to read them. Yeah. Well, thank you. And also, Ed, thank you, Mr. Session, too. James will be vice chair. So. Uh, it's nice to see new blood. Let's see if it's good blood. Yeah. It's just blood and water. <laughs> we don't want to have to drink moxie, but that's all I'm concerned with. Uh, it's a requirement of the chair. The chair has to wear moxie. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Uh, I would just like to, uh, oh. if I could, because yes. Mr. Maroon was always good. He always asked me if I had anything to say. <laughs> Probably a big mistake, but he did it anyway. <laughs> And I would like to also thank Mr. Maroon for his years of service. He's also been the chair, except for one year, he's been the chair uh, for my entire um, tenure here in town. And I think he's done a wonderful job. And I, I do, I, I thank him, and I do also agree that I think it is good to have new blood. So congratulations and, and good luck. And certainly, I think Mark would, would be a good resource for you. I'll try to be a good resource for you. Uh, Jay is also there, so any help we can give you, uh, any uh, extra coaching or anything that you feel you need, we can certainly look for those training opportunities if they're out there for from MMA or from whatever. But looking forward to um, a successful um, year ahead. And don't forget, we'll, we'll be back here again next year. And, <laughs> And the process will continue. Maybe by that time there'll be additional new blood. Maybe Leroy will be sick of me and <laughs> well, not be a chair. I might only have one year left on my term. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it may be mandatory that we have. But anyway, thank thank you all. I really do appreciate the I appreciate the job you've done. I appreciate the job you will do, and the help that I'm sure you will will provide for him. Because you'll probably have to start most of the meetings since he's five minutes late. Oh, that's <laughs> right. Hey, I get to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. That's all I have to do. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, Mr. Owen did a great job, and is is in his tenure. Mr. Lorzal backing up. You guys did a great job. I was kind of trying to change the vote a little bit, but you guys kind of threw that one at me. Thank you. When everybody voted yes. So. I was going for Mr. Maroon, but yes. Sorry, not sorry. Okay. Yes. Somebody had a motion. Yeah, motion to adjourn. Second. Yes. I've got just one item. There's a letter here from Walter Wilson about getting an extension on a... That wasn't supposed to be in these packets. No. I don't know where that is. That's came. for next next month. I oh, okay. So it, it just hold on, on to it. Mr. Yeah. Blaze, you never saw it. Yeah. Oh, quick question before you adjourn. Um, did we need to ask if there were any letters for the repeal before the last one? Or well, that was an administrative appeal, did you have to fill that requirement for letters? Uh, on the SATLAC appeal? Yeah, because I didn't ask if there were any letters sent in the department. There was just the letter from um, the attorney, correct? Which we have in record. In every, yeah. Okay. I, just didn't, I, I didn't have any others. Uh, okay. I just want to make sure we cover the basics. I'm sorry. We did. We had one, just comments from Jim Netto. And you all should have received that. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a sur the, uh, the, the person who performed the yeah. property survey. Yeah. Okay. Um, the the Dominax, the the, the uh, owners of Four East Grand, okay. provided that just the other yeah. day to me. But um, oh, we don't have to read it. No. It's in the record. It's okay. there in the file. Okay. Yeah. I think there was plenty of testimony. I wanted to make sure we covered the basis on that. Thank you all. I appreciate all your help. We haven't voted on it yet. I know, because everybody motion. keeps having calls. Oh. We have a motion to adjourn, motion second the motion. All in favor. Unanimous. <laughs> All right. We can adjourn. <laughs> I like it. Oh. Oh, you got to hit the thing. You are.